Okay, so we looked at a, uh, a simple circuit, a, a plug-in. I guess if I need a, a visual aid, I've got uh, something right there. I got the uh, the, the plug-in. And uh, if this is, let's say, a 15 amp circuit, we would have uh, 15 amps here. It's probably either 15 or 20, uh, depending on the uh, the shape of the plug-in. <coughs> and we looked at a, a case where you case where you had a fault in the appliance, uh, some sort of a short or um, something wrong happened in the appliance and and while that ground path was important so that it didn't go through the the, the user this uh, circuit breaker or this fuse up here is really just to protect the wire okay uh, because we know that uh, 15 amps is more than enough to cook you uh, one thing to, to also think about this on some appliances that don't have a ground there's this this feature where it's uh, polarized and a good example of this is a lamp. If you look at, uh, go home and look at a uh, lamp, uh, the, the plug in a lamp will be arranged that only plugs in one way. And that's, uh, the, the reason is, is if you look at a uh, lamp socket, there's two connect conductors in a lamp socket. There's the side where the lamp screws in, and then there's the button in the bottom of that. And what they want to do is they want to make sure that this hot one ends up on the uh, button, and then this uh, neutral or this common ends up on the sides and that's uh, for the reason for instance if you were screwing in then the uh, light bulb okay and you happen to uh, you know have some sweat on here it got onto this would you want this to be the uh, hot side you would not would you okay uh, you would want this to be the common because if you look at this neutral or the common it's actually at the same potential as ground isn't it in fact, somewhere probably in your electrical system, if you live in a mobile home or a trailer house, this may not be the case. Uh, they keep these separate. You'd have earth ground and chassis ground. Uh, but most of you living in a you know a, a, a site built house, the uh, the neutral line that's probably going to be the white wire, and the uh, ground that's going to be the green wire or have no insulation at all are actually connected together at some point, and that's actually called a bond. That's probably going to take care. Take place at your uh, at your breaker panel or your fuse panel. Yes. Yeah, I didn't even know you weren't supposed to put it on while it's plugged in. I, I always like to put it on while it's plugged in. That way, I see it, it light up. So, yeah. But yeah, they had that. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. The. Uh, yeah, they, they they should have that protection. Now, but before we uh, end up risking it all on that protection, remember, if, if someone hasn't wired this in, it'll probably still work just fine, and it'll be backwards. So before you go home and you start shoving a paper clip into this large prong here and, and showing people how you won't get shocked, you might want to test and make sure it's hooked up right. Because that plug it'll probably work just fine if someone's hooked it up wrong, so you try and play around with it like that. Over there. So then, I guess the more obvious question is why... Well, remember that we need the common because we're going to be uh, running our, our loads between here. So we put the load in here between the, the common and the, or the uh, hot and the common. Okay, And that's why they, look, everything works just fine even if you cut the ground off. But the ground is simply there for your protection. Okay, So if you have some sort of a, a short, it'll go to ground rather than going through you. And we saw that uh, last time. Okay. Yes. So what is what in between uh, just uh, to the right and above the uh, the ground arrow? Right here, this arrow? Yeah, just above. Oh, bond? Yeah, it's called a bond, B O N D. And somewhere probably in your fuse panel or your breaker panel there's a connection where you'll actually physically hook the common wires to the ground. Other questions? So if you decide to, uh, to, to do some uh, searching in your fuse panel or breaker panel, be real careful when you take the uh, 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 cover off of that thing because uh, there's a lot of electricity in there. If you drop something in there, uh, we could then talk about arc blast. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that before we wrap up. So that, that's that plug-in. Pretty straightforward, right? Okay. And then sometimes you see, particularly if you're in areas where it's around water or outside or in the kitchen or something like that, you'll see a little different plug-in. You'll see one that looks like that, right? Okay. And this goes by uh, several different names, GFI or uh, GFCI. 
Um, ground fault interrupt, ground fault circuit interrupt are all possibilities. They have a lot of different protection devices now, probably in a new house, most of you have um, arc fault devices or arc fault breakers. Uh, as far as the GFI, that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to call it a GFI, uh, I probably should say GFCI. Just because you don't see one of those doesn't mean that it's not protected this way because you can get a breaker that's at your breaker panel that does this same thing. Uh, but uh, you've probably seen these. It's got a test and a reset, and you might wonder, well, well how does this work? Okay, uh, so here's how it works. We have the source here, which is probably going to have about 120 volts RMS. And you could imagine current leaving here, and it's going to go through a um, an inductor here. There's going to be this core, and by, by, the simp by virtue of it being wrapped around there, it's going to produce some magnetic flux in this core. Okay, and the, the current's going to come out of here, the same current, and it's going to go through the load. And hopefully everything is okay in this load, and the current will continue to go through here to the common. Okay, to the common, through the common, back through this, and they wind this very carefully so that this produces a magnetic flux in the opposite direction. Now, if this current here, I, is the same as that current there, what do you know about those magnetic fluxes? They should be equal and opposite, and they should cancel each other out, right? Okay, so with, what we'll have is a sensing coil here. We'll have some circuitry, and we'll have a sensing coil, and it should sense zero magnetic flux inside that core. That means everything's good, right? Okay. Well, let's say something goes bad. So we get some fault in here, and we have some current going to ground. So some current's going to ground. You got the toaster. Someone threw the toaster in the bathtub. Some current is going to ground. So that would mean that this current here, maybe I'll write this as I, is much larger than this current here, right? So will these uh, magnetic fluxes c cancel each other out? They will not. So you will get some net flux in this, and your sensing circuit will then uh, go up here and, uh, and effectively open this thing up. This happens in about 400th of a second. Okay, so that's why they put these things around uh, water, uh, outdoor, and things like that. Uh, and you probably maybe had some experience with them that they can be uh, very sensitive. Uh, sometimes even if you take an extension cord and drag it through the grass and it's got a little dew on the end of it, that'll be enough to uh, to trip it. I've had that happen. So you always get interesting students through the year. I had this one guy that uh, asked the question one time. Well, if those are in the bathroom and the kitchen, if my wife plugs the toaster in in the living room with an extension cord and throws it in the bathtub with me, I'm still in trouble. And I said, yes, you're still in trouble. So I'm not sure what kind of a home life he had. But anyway, <laughs> anyway so, so this seems like a pretty good deal, right? So why don't we have them everywhere? I mean, they're, they're building codes. We've got to have them in kitchens. We've got to have them in bathrooms. We've got to have them... Uh, around water, hot tub areas, things like that, uh, outside on the patios and porches and whatnot. But why don't we put them everywhere? Seems like a pretty good idea. Put it in the living room. Yeah, someone's out there going like this. Money. Yeah. I can get this thing for about probably about 35 cents. Okay, it's not the world's greatest plug-in. It's not industrial grade, but I can get it for about 35 cents. This one, about uh, the best I've seen is I can get three for about uh, $27. Big difference. Yeah, big difference. Okay. Uh, then there's also, I mean, sometimes you do get, uh, you have problems where it, it doesn't work. It's a little too sensitive. Um, and probably means you're getting pro pretty close to shocking yourself, but uh, that can be, uh, uh, you know, frustrating too. So, uh, again, the, the big reason is cost. Uh, the other thing with this, if you if you see one of these in your kitchen and then you see several that are not don't look like this in the kitchen, you can actually protect uh, several downstream with this. This has provisions. If you put this one in and then you wire properly the ones beyond that, it'll protect those. So you're, you're probably in good shape in your kitchen because you can protect. If you if you see something in your kitchen like this, um, most likely if it's uh, wired right, this one is actually protecting that one. So. Questions with that? Yes? I just had a question about the diagram on the GFI. Okay. So we've been uh, dealing with kind of flat inductors for going at it. Mm -hmm. so you, we draw it for the multiple flooding notes. Uh, yeah, I mean, 
our inductors, you're right, till now is uh, we've we've taken a a single core and we've wrapped something uh, around it like that, right? Okay. Um, usually a toroidal core, and I'm not sure whether it has a toroidal core or not. That'd be probably the most efficient. Uh, fairly common to have a, a core that looks like this, where we just wrap this around. And we're going to get into those pretty fast when we start talking about transformers. So this symbol is uh, is that what we use? Oh well, the, the schematic symbol is probably going to look something like that. Okay. Or you talked about the equal and opposite thing. Where where did that come from? Well, depending on how this is wrapped and which direction the current's going through it, will determine whether the magnetic flux is going to go one way or the other. And we'll definitely get into that when we do this. Circular, circular core. Uh huh. On the other side, you said there's a um, but they going around one way and then coming in the other way. Should you pull each other out? Yep, they should cancel each other out. With the, the current at the bottom by the common magnet. Yes. This this current here should pr produce a magnetic flux that should be opposite of this current here, so they'll cancel each other out. And when we get into transformers, we'll talk about the specific geometry of, of how you can do that. It's a right-hand rule problem. Other questions? Yes? Yeah, this is a fuse. It's not a box. This, uh, this would be the schematic symbol for a fuse. Other questions? Okay, good. So some some practical things there. Let's uh, let's try this problem here. We've got a uh, scenario where we've got a uh, crane. So we've got some sort of a, a crane that gets uh, tangled up in the power lines. The power line is 7,200 volts. That's pretty common. We have power lines all over the place that are different values, but most of them coming into your neighborhood and whatnot are probably going to be 7,200 volts. And in fact, then you might have a, a transformer that's uh, hung on the uh, pole here and uh, from one of these lines into the transformer, and the transformer is going to pick up uh, ground, and then you'll have uh, the line into your house. It looks like a fairly humble house. But anyway, uh, so we've got something like that. So anyway... This line is at 7,200 volts. We get the uh, crane up into it, and uh, this is grounded here. And the, uh, the, what's happened is the operator has probably watched a little bit of TV and knows that uh, he or she needs to jump clear of this vehicle. A little bit different. It's a tracked vehicle. And uh, jumps clear and is uh, happy to still be alive and starts to run this way. Okay? And in running that way, they're electrocuted. So you want to try and figure out what happened. Okay? And then also talk about uh, uh, ways of, of preventing this. So what happened is this, uh, we set up a voltage gradient because if this is 7,200 volts, we'd say the end of the crane there is 7,200. Of course, this would be 7,200. And down here at the ground, we now have, what, 7,200 volts, don't we? We're not going to say there's a very much voltage drop across that. Over here we have what? At ground we have zero volts, don't we? So we've set up this gradient over 10 feet. So I could say that this voltage gradient is equal to uh, 7,200 volts divided by 10 feet, which gives me 720 volts per foot. Okay. You probably do some experiments in physics, either this term or probably next term, where you set up some, some voltage gradients. Hopefully you don't set up gradients this large. Um, but we've got a, a voltage gradient there. Now let's say that this person is running, so they have a stride. Um, and we'll say that the stride is three feet. Okay. So what is the potential from foot to foot? Uh, 720 volts per foot times 3 feet, which is going to give me 2160 volts. Is that right? So then what's the current going to be here? Well, if I look at I could say that the current is going to be 
2160 divided by, so voltage divided by resistance. So I could say that I have uh, 15,000 ohms times 2. That'd be the uh, resistance for the skin in each foot, which that's uh, the dry value. That's probably being uh, a little reckless using that. It's probably got sweaty feet. Then we'd have uh, 2 times 100. That's for the legs. Skin, legs, plus uh, 200 for the trunk. So let's see what that turns out to be. I don't think I have a number for that. Zero point zero seven uh, amps, which is seventy what milliamps. So what do we think? What's going to happen? It takes a tenth of a milliamp to kill someone, right? Yeah, it's a bad day. It's a bad day. And like I said, I, I mean. This, if, if you say, well, this is not very much, most likely this is a real idealization. But uh, uh, sweaty feet and whatnot, this could uh, go down, which would drive that number way up, wouldn't it? Now, we haven't taken into account whether he's, you know, in leather shoes or rubber shoes and things like that. Um, but you probably don't want to risk your safety to uh, what kind of soles you have on, uh, what you have on the soles of your shoes, right? So how could we uh, avoid this problem? I mean, let's let's we'll talk a little bit about avoiding the problem altogether. But let's say he's had a bad day. He's put the crane in the wire. How could he uh, avoid dying now? If the tracks were made of rubber. Okay, if he had a, a crane, a truck-mounted crane, the tracks were made of rubber. That would insulate it. Uh, in in that case, he'd have to be careful to definitely jump clear of the vehicle. Right? He wouldn't want to be touching the ground in the vehicle all at one time. What would be another scenario? Uh, well, the vehicle's grounded for sure. Yeah, but uh, if if it's a uh, rubber-tired vehicle, that becomes uh, very important. A lot of times, the uh, utility companies, as they uh, put someone up and have them working in a boom, if the uh, usually the boom is isolated, but uh, if they have a problem, the truck can become isolated, and then a person that walks over and touches the truck can get shocked. So they will. Uh, ground the truck. They'll actually take a ground rod and drive it in the ground and hook the truck right to it if they're going to be working on something like that. Now that makes it particularly dangerous for the people up here, but usually they have really good isolation on these. So yeah, proper grounding, although this was grounded. Well yeah, avoid this. Yeah, so maybe uh, have a lookout. So we'd want to have a, another person over here with big eyes looking at this thing, Mr. Owl, trying to keep him out of the power line to begin with. Yeah, the, the uh, best solution is not to get in that mess to begin with. Yeah? What else? Well, there's potential we took a distance that's three feet, so we can limit the potential. Right. Yeah, so change this to zero. Hop. <laughs> well, if it just hopped, feet together, yeah, hop. Opt out of there. Yeah. Do they not have a setting on the cranes that have a kind of automatic limit to how high you go? Uh, I don't know that they have that, no. I don't know that you can limit the crane height. There you go. There's an app for you. Yeah, to. to uh, so the uh, reply here is to, to not jump where the potential is. If he would have run the other way, but it's kind of hard to figure out wh where the ground is. It's probably going to be a ground at most post. So if he would have come out of the page or into the page, that would have been good. I might uh, go one step further on your thing and say not jump at all. Okay. So not jump at all. Stay in the vehicle. Particularly in something like this, you're not going to have to worry about the tires catching on fire. If it's got rubber tired vehicle, you, oftentimes the tires will catch on fire in a scenario like this. So, so you said you jumped over the side of the I Apparently. Or a YouTube video. One of the two. With the hardened steel tracks is almost an advantage here because they will 
Yeah, if he would with the steel tracks, if he would just stayed put, he would be in, in better shape. Yeah. So. So you got to you got to look at all the the possibilities. One time uh, when we were over in building four, a garbage truck forgot to put its boom down. I think the the driver was maybe late for a date or something. Took out a bunch of power lines and they actually fell over the uh, metal uh, uh, structure where people wait for the bus. Okay. And uh, people started to come and look around for this, and, and, and I, I told security that I thought they probably needed to get people away from the metal structure. I didn't know whether the lines were energized or not, but I just thought that was probably a bad combination, a metal structure with power lines draped over it. And this also uh, costs uh, good Samaritans all the time. There'll be uh, an, a, a horrible auto accidents. They knock down some power lines. The power lines go over a fence, and the Good Samaritan trying to come to the aid, uh, maybe a quarter mile away, will be electrocuted. What happened? Power lines energized the fence, didn't they? Okay. What's that? Yeah, uh, yeah, a real electric fence there. So, but uh, the the best solution to this is is not to uh, not to let it happen. The power company, they'll come out and they'll put uh, insulation on these wires. They have a poly, a plastic things or poly things that they'll snap onto them to protect it. Don't operate too close to the wires. I think it's illegal to operate within 10 feet of the wires. So avoid the uh, situation in the beginning. Questions of that? Yes? So yeah, he, he was he was walking, okay, so he had two legs on the ground separated by some distance. I guess theoretically the difference between technically the difference between walking and running, if he was running, he would have technically been okay. But uh, there again, I, I'd, I'd hate to risk my life on the difference between walking and running stride. Other questions? Yes? So if you recommend just popping, if you did have to... Well, I, I'd recommend one not getting into the situation to begin with and uh, two if, if if it if you were there I'd stay in the vehicle if you you know if you had to get out then uh, hopping would uh, would do okay are you actually pretty likely not not to be electrocuted if that happened or would you, like if you stayed in you know in the frame then you can survive the job well, if, if you're in the crane, you essentially have like a Faraday cage around you, so you'd be fine. Uh, now, if now what will happen is if it's a rubber-tied vehicle, a lot of times the tires start to get tired of this and they catch on fire. Uh, that's probably not going to happen with this. So, depending on, I mean, you could you could have all kinds of problems. You could have currents going through fuel lines and maybe uh, uh, start fires and things like that. I'm not going to say that staying in it is perfectly safe, but it's probably one of your best scenarios at that point. So. I don't plan on ever doing this, but if I find myself in a situation, I'm not going to survive, maybe. There you go. Yeah. Yes? So, how do you get the trade on? Draw the wire? Yeah, you're going to have to get the power company involved in this. Yeah. So. D double down with another crane. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Okay, so let's talk about. I think you got it. I think you had a homework problem where uh, you had a homework problem where I think it said a mechanic's ring. Uh, they were hooking the battery up in a car, and the mechanic's ring, I think you got 700 watts of power into or something like that. Uh, it's always interesting to see what, what students say that'll do. Sometimes students say, well, the ring gets hot. Well, yeah, that's an understatement. I mean, it gets very hot. So but the person's not going to die, but it's sure going to ruin their day. I mean, they're going to get a tremendous burn. And that probably happen to have the ring cut off and whatnot. So let's uh, see how we want to, to, to avoid that problem. So if you're uh, working on your car and you um, want to work on the battery, should you hook or unhook the uh, ground first or the positive first? Let's say that this is hooked up. So we have the uh, positive going off somewhere and we have the negative that's uh, effectively hooked to the chassis like that. Okay. So what do we want to do? Do we want to work on the positive lead? I mean most batteries nowadays is negative ground, right? Okay. 
Uh, if you go back uh, or, or you look at some odd imports or something, maybe it's positive ground. Uh, historically, and back in 6-volt systems, they probably had that. But nowadays, the last uh, 50 years, it's mainly negative ground. So which one do you want to work on first? Well, let's see. If we have a wrench on the positive and that wrench uh, slips, so we have a wrench here and it uh, slips over to here, what do we have? Yeah, you have, you're going to start to do some welding here, aren't you? Okay. So let's try this. What happens if I have a wrench over here and it slips and comes in contact with that? Just another ground, not a big deal. So my best plan is to unhook this one first, set it aside. Now that it's been unhooked, if I go and work on this one and happen to uh, go from here over to the chassis, what's going to happen? Nothing, because it's not grounded, right? Yeah. So in, in reverse order here, that was unhooking. What if we want to hook these up? What should we do? Should we hook the ground up first? No, we'd want to hook this up first. We'd make this as our first connection. And then, because if, uh, if we happen to have our wrench strike the side, it's not going to do anything. And then when I make the connection to ground as the second connection, it's just another ground path. So the order in, a, in something like this, the order can be very important. Now this is a 12 volt battery. If you start getting into hybrid vehicles and whatnot, it's a whole different ball game. You're looking at about 300 volts, and it can uh, kill you real quick. So, questions of that? Have you ever used a uh, battery to tackle something in a pinch? Well, I don't think purposely. No. So. Yeah, 12 volts is probably not going to work real well if you take two batteries and put them in series. 24 will get you a little better. If you have three, 36, now you'll start to get somewhere. So, uh, but it's going to it's going to uh, lack a lot of control. It's, but yeah, theoretically you can do it. I think some people have done it. I think it is very hard to try and weld with one battery. Though 12 volts is probably not enough. Uh, let's see, a few other things in safety as we uh, start to uh, think about wrapping this up. Uh, arc blast, uh, those of you that go into and, and make your living with electrical will probably do some training in arc blast. Um, what happens is uh, when you sh uh, short something out, a lot of times the, the conductors vaporize. Okay? I saw this uh, one case where you had a, uh, it was a, a box, an electrical box, and it had a couple big conductors in it. Okay. So they were probably running 400, 500 amps in this thing. And they went to put the cover on this thing, and they didn't hit it quite right, and the cover went in and went across these bus bars. It actually melted a great big chunk out of the cover at each of the bus bars. Okay. So what happens? Where does that stuff go that it melts out? It actually vaporizes. Okay. You're going to be looking somewhere around 50 to 100,000 times expansion on that, which... That'll have some power, right? Ste a steam explosion is about a thousand times, so this is uh, fifty to a hundred times greater than a steam explosion. So that's why you can have, you know, tremendous burning, tr a tremendous heat, shrapnel, uh, hot metal, all of the bad stuff. Um, Isn't some of the, the things that they're trying to do, like the Tesla, when they're trying to have that battle? I, Tesla did a lot of things, yeah. Also talked with pigeons in the park, so he, he did a lot of things. So, But I, it wouldn't surprise me. Okay. I never really know what to do with Tesla. I don't want to uh, uh, under uh, underestimate him, but I'm uh, never really sure what to do with everything. So. Other questions? Yes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think if you want to go into elect, uh, looking at uh, people that have uh, shocked or maimed themselves in electrical and, and being an expert witness for the, the defense or for the uh, prosecution, you're probably going to want to uh, develop some expertise by being an electrical engineer in that area for, for several years. And then, and then you go in and, no, not being electrocuted. <laughs> and then you'll, then you'll start practicing in, in, in forensics. I mean, one of the things to, to make you a really good witness is that you've been around this for a while. No one wants to put you up on the stand and the, the, uh, the 
uh, opposing people say, well, can you talk to us about your credentials? And you say, yeah, I've been doing this for three months. Okay, You want to be able to say, well, I've done this for 10 years. And, and I've been working on lots of cases like this. So, so usually it's a matter of getting some experience before you start practicing in forensics. So, um, a few other things in terms of safety. The uh, just flip this over. Let's see. Uh, yeah, that's a breaker. So this happens to be a 220 breaker. So you, you have essentially a uh, two single breakers put together. And I'll pass this around. And when I pass it around, you can actually uh, move these. And you'll find out this, this one doesn't feel right. Okay. This was actually one I uh, had on a uh, furnace. It wasn't working. And uh, I actually checked it before I worked on it. And because uh, the problem is, is they were hooked together. So you could think that they were off. Uh, but this one feels kind of uh, weird, and in fact, it's never off. Okay, so it's always on. So it probably is a as a good thing to test it. I think OSHA now requires you. You can't just say, "Well, this is off," and decide to start working on it. You have to not only turn it off, but you have to actually check to make sure that it's off. Uh, you could use a voltmeter, or there's a lot of different testing equipment to do that. A really uh, kind of handy piece of testing equipment is a non-contact tester like this. Um, so they, they're kind of cool. You can turn it on. And if, if you put this on here, it'll start to beep if there's uh, power. Now, this will give a lot of false warnings, but the, the warnings are usually a, a false positive, which tends to be more safe than a false negative, right? Okay. Uh, one of the biggest ones is some static. I think if you, yeah, you can get it going if you get some static on this. So uh, anyway, there's that. It, what's that? Yeah, it's, it's fairly sensitive. Oh, yeah. We got the outlet here. Okay, so I'll go ahead and start sending these around. The, uh, if you're going to start making your living with electricity and whatnot, you need to start uh, thinking about ways of making sure it's a long living. Uh, usually when you go to work somewhere, one of the first things that you'll do is you'll do some safety training. If the place where you go to work isn't big on safety, that, that's probably a hint to you, right? Okay. Who, who spends time in the hospital better the more? You do, right? Not your boss. You do. So um, make sure that uh, you're operating safety. Safely. One of the things here is uh, lockout, tagout, right? Is that still in focus? I guess kind of. So there's things where you can uh, secure something. So we always talk about, well, you want to turn it off before you work on it, right? Okay, well, how do you make sure someone doesn't come along and turn it back on on you? You can put one of these on it. These are kind of nice because if you lock it out, and you'll probably put a tag on it who's locked it out. And uh, you, sh you should be the only one that has a key to that padlock. Okay. There should be no one else that has a key to that padlock. Not the other people, but not the other technicians, not your boss. You should be the only one that has a key to that padlock. Okay. Um, and then if someone else comes to work on this thing and they want it locked out, they're going to put their lock here. So when you pull your lock off of it, it's still safe for them, right? Okay. Uh, this device here, you can actually unplug something and you put the plug in there. Uh, and then you can lock it shut so someone doesn't plug that in. Uh, so, so you want to make sure that uh, when you turn something off to work on it, it stays off. You also want to test it. There's been horrible cases where someone has turned something off, uh, locked it out, and unfortunately it was the wrong one. Okay. So confirm that you've turned off the, the, the correct one. And like I say, you, you don't want to use this as a, a way to shirk doing your job, but if, if where you work, if they're not interested in your safety, that's a, a good indication you want to polish up that resume and go to some place that is. Questions? Oh, right here. I guess if I had the key for this, uh, you take it out, and it's it's like scissors. It opens up. It's I got a pivot right here, and we'll open up. Oh well, usually on the 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 not a breaker panel like you'd have in your house, but usually in an industrial situation, they'll have a safety switch that is a spot you can put a padlock in it. 
they look almost like a, a lock or a PE locker or something like that. And they, they make lockouts for the panels in your house. They're just a little more cumbersome than this. So, other questions? I mean, it's basically like this. A hole lines up and you can put a lock through it. Any other questions? Well, where we will go when we get together next time is to talk about polyphase circuits, poly meaning many phases, and uh, probably the, the most common is three phase. So I'll, I'll probably not call it polyphase for very long and start just calling it uh, three phase. We'll start looking at three phase uh, circuits. So again, just like power, this is probably not going to be so difficult from an analysis standpoint, but more difficult from a, uh, a verbiage and a definition standpoint. So that's where we'll go when we get together next time. Take care till then. Thank <laughs> you.